I'm struggling. <laughs> Bloopers. What am I supposed to call you during this? I struggle. Do, do I call you Juan? Do I call you Mr. G? Like, what do I call you? Do I call you Nuni Junior? Oh. <laughs> Clean yours. I, I seriously think mine has like a residue or something over it. Get, yeah, get in there. Show, show <laughs> boss. Hello, every. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Lettered Classroom. Today, I am joined with my cousin, Mr. G. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> it's like a three-second delay. Is there? I don't know. Okay, sorry. If you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Bridget Spackman. I am a teacher in Pennsylvania, and I teach a multi-age classroom, meaning that I teach fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. I taught kindergarten previously in Alabama for four years, and I am really excited that you are all here and to join Mr. G and I in a little conversation today. Uh, today, we are doing a sit-down teacher talk with all of you, and we're here to answer some questions that you guys have. And we're answering these questions not because we think we're experts, but because we think that the teacher community thrives and is better when we share our stories of experience, share our own advice. Uh, so I just want to say that because as we're making this video, it's not because we know everything, because every single day we're getting better because we're learning and we're growing, but because we just want to share our stories with you and you might find it interesting or you might find it helpful. So yeah let's get into it and i feel like this question is extremely fitting for a first question um but it says so i would really love to know what inspired you and juan to become teachers in my personal journey teaching was not on my career radar i love that i w was encouraged to teach and after 22 years it's been my dream job so what, it, awesome. what i've always kind of wondered this about you jay and I don't, i've never really asked this question uh -huh. why did you become a teacher why did I become a teacher? I, I, I feel like it's so much a part of me that it's just like what I've always known and what I've always wanted. Um, I've, I've always loved school and I feel so lucky that I've had throughout my years in being a student myself, just having great teachers. Uh, but it really, for me, like it really came together when I was in high school. And we had this like uh, daycare program. Oh my where gosh, I was, remember you doing that. Yes, and they, it was called Trooper School, and it was yeah. like a small amount of students, and we were responsible for making lesson plans and uh, hanging out with three and four-year-olds. And it was the creating part of the teaching, like how can, I, how can I take something and make it exciting, or how can I just present it so then the students get knowledge. And so when I started doing that in high school, I said, oh, I really like this. And, uh, and then that, that's what planted the seed. And then of course, like as you start to grow up and then you start mm -hmm. to think about where you wanna take your life, like that is the only thing that I ever grew. That's the only thing that I ever wanted to put myself in and what I was passionate about. So it was definitely that, it was having that high school class and then it just kept growing and it's what I wanted and I couldn't think of anything else that I wanted to do. And here I am. That's awesome. Well, we all know my story. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I had no idea what I wanted to do with life. I I wasn't as, I guess, focused as you were, you know, like I, you remember, like I wanted to be an interior designer. Oh, I wanted I to be a psychologist. That's a whole nother, <laughs> we, I should make this all, my own other video. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, it goes on and on and on. But I feel like for me, what it kind of finally hit it was when I had Ian. Um, mm -hmm. When I had Ian, it was just like, okay, Bridget, it's time to wake up. It's time to like get serious and, you know, do something with your life so that you can support your kid. So yeah. that kind of gave me the wake up call and got me out of just the stupid things that I was doing with myself. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And during that time, mom was, you remember like my mom, like his aunt, okay, whatever. Um, yeah. But, you know, mom was in uh training so you remember with whataburger she did training there and then i did some trainings when i worked at red lobster as like a, a manager and i helped like train other things and um junior at that time was going to school to be a teacher and i said i mean why not i mean my mom likes teaching she does it it's not like the same teaching that junior is doing but why not why not try this and you know i could take a couple classes and if it ends up not working out for me then I just changed my degree I mean I've done it like five times already so 
it ended up working out for me and I've loved it ever since. So it's been cool. It's been great. Yeah. And another thing I want to add, like every job that I took on while I was in college had to do something with yeah. the kids. So it was like an Do you remember school. the summer camp one? The summer camp. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That one was so cool. It was very cool. It was I, so cool. It was, uh, what it was, it was just like a summer camp where kids came in daily, different kids from like different programs. And we showed them, uh, like trails and, animals and it was so n nothing that I ever thought I'd have I'd ever do but when I did it it gave me this very like cliche yeah. uh, summer camp uh but I don't know it was one of the coolest things cute. I've done um I still talk about it when I when it comes up because it's one of the coolest things I've done but in working with kids in the the jobs that I would take mm -hmm. like the part-time jobs um that only helped me figure out like how to build relationships and meeting different kids and that really, I think, helped me when I actually got my own classroom because I've had so much experience of being around kids and knowing how they work, or not knowing how they work, but knowing how to build relationships with right. all the different types that I was able to meet. And I'm still meeting many different types of kids. <laughs> yeah, no love, no joke. That is so true. But, and you know what, I guess like the, the other thing I wanted to add in there is just, I think you, when we were always good cousins, but I feel like once we both had this career in teaching, Mm -hmm. I feel like our relationship as cousins like became yeah. closer. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's been, and I never, I never thought really about cool. that because we've always been close without this, right? Without like right. teaching. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we've become closer. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Oh, yeah. Then, yeah. so it's been cool. Yes. Very cool. Just throwing that out there. I heart you. <laughs> oh, I'm that's a start. <laughs> question number two. Question is, what is the best advice that you have for student teachers and what do teachers expect from student teachers? Well, that's a really good question. It is a good one. I feel like I have, so two parts. First part, I'm going to like re-give this question back to you. Okay. First part was that the, what advice do I have for student teachers, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a lot of advice for student teachers. Um, I, I was so fortunate to be in a school my very first year in Alabama where we have tons of student teachers. I don't know about the school that you're in now. Like the school that I'm in now, I don't have a ton of student teachers. Mm -hmm. But the one that I was in, I had a ton. Um, and I would always just be like, please don't do that. Please don't do that. And back in my head, I keep thinking all of these same things. So I've like created a little mental list of all of the things that I would love to tell student teachers just to kind of help you guys out because I feel like I just want to hold you and just like carry you through the whole process. So I think the very first thing that I would say is smile. Um, smile, smile, smile. Never be seen without that smile on your face. Um, I know as much as like you feel like you are having a really rough day, that it is so stressful, that the kids are driving you nuts, that you don't understand what's going on, smile. <laughs> um, I cannot even count how many times teachers would come back and they would say, did you see her? Like, she just looked like she just hated her life. Like, she looked like she just did not enjoy what she was doing. So the, the smile, I feel like, just shows that you care and that you want to be there. And that's what you want to kind of show people is that you really do want to be here, no matter the good, the bad, the crazy, you know, the sad, like, during all of it, just smile. <laughs> do you think so, Jay? Oh, yeah. And I think, um, you know, I did the student teaching route. I know we go into the classroom in different ways, but I did the student teaching route. And so I still remember the, that experience, right? Cause you're kind of like in the same, uh, group of people and doing the student teaching and you're connecting and you're kind of sharing your experiences with each other cause you're in the same bubble. Yeah, absolutely. And then I've had the pleasure of having two student teachers in my career. And then I've seen them like in my school as well. And I think that's one of the biggest things you have to remember. It's like, and I've, I'm sure you've heard this before, if you're about to be a student teacher or you're in it, it's like, just be a sponge, like get in there, mm -hmm. be excited um, and know that even in that little time that you're going to be there, you're not going to learn everything. So take in what you can while you're there and know that it's, that's just the beginning. And then it's just going to keep, you're just going to, every year when you do the work as a teacher, like you're going to keep getting better. You're going to keep growing. Yeah. So take that time while you're in that classroom to be a sponge, to take things in and then do it with a, with a smile, like Bridget was saying, because 
sometimes you might get a mentor teacher that's not, maybe you don't fit with them or maybe you're having a bad time with the students. But what's important, and that's for us too, I think in the classroom, mm -hmm. it's like you gotta find uh, the good in it because this job is hard. Like, of course, I'm, uh, if you look at our Instagram, like you're seeing really fun moments and, and I love talking about the good moments, but it's not to say that uh, the bad doesn't exist because it does. And so when you learn how to channel that and just kind of know that tomorrow's a new day and you can't kids are resilient and then you learn to be resilient too. Mm -hmm. And the next day you're just, it's better. Yeah. So yes, definitely having a smile, being excited and then be a sponge, take everything in. Um, yep. To because, piggyback kind of off of that, Jay, like I would highly recommend for you to create a journal, some type of a diary, something to be able to kind of put all of that information that you put down. Like I so greatly wished that I had one spot that had all of the ideas that so many different teachers have given me. Like I kind of pull up my laptop and I'm like, oh, that's what, the, look at that. And that was from like when I was like intern, doing my internship in first grade, or that was when I was at the fourth grade classroom. But like, I don't have it in one spot. So like, I really wish I did. Um, mm -hmm. And take pictures. If you like, that would be the first thing that I would recommend to you. I'm a huge visual person. I do so much better um, being able to see things visually, which is probably why Pinterest came out, <laughs> right? Because everybody does really well with pictures, but take pictures I of everything. Understand. You know what I mean? Like, um, I, I, I feel like I, I can look at a picture and recall all of the information that I got from it. Do you know what I, you yeah. know what I'm talking about? Um, and I would even ask to go and observe other teachers. So mm -hmm. when I was pretty much done with my teaching, because you have to teach for, I think like it's what, two, three, four weeks, depending on, you know, your university, but mm -hmm. you kind of start weaning yourself off at the very end to kind of give all of that teaching back to your mentor teacher. Uh, I would end up saying, hey, for this like hour, can I go like hop around to other classrooms to kind of see what they're doing as well? And I would take the opportunity to do it in different like grades. Mm -hmm. So during that time, I would take my little like notebook and I would take my camera and I would just snap pictures everywhere I went. Like it helped me so much. Mm -hmm. I think the second part to that question was about mentor yeah. teachers. Yes. What do te like what do mentor teachers expect of a student mm -hmm. teacher? I think that's really hard because every teacher is different and every teacher runs their classrooms very differently. Mm -hmm. um, there will be some teachers who will totally want you to just jump right in and say, yeah, go for it. I want you to just, you know, start doing things with the kids. I want you to do this. And there will be other teachers that want you to sit back and just kind of get the understanding of how the classroom is run, get the understanding of how, you know, the students operate, getting to know them a little bit more personally. So I feel like the best answer for that question is to just ask your mentor teacher um, mm. up front, send them an email, ask them if you can have a day where you guys can meet before you actually start your internship, or maybe after that first day of your internship, sit down and say, you know, what are the expectations for me? What are some things that you would like to see me doing? And can we, you know, start planning out, you know, when I'm going to start taking things over. So, yeah. I mean, be honest and just kind of have that communication. Communication is key when it comes to your mentor teacher. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's the best answer. Like just ask them because we are different. If you were in my classroom, I'm going to just throw you up there and say, show me what you got. Because <laughs> then I can see what you got or what you have. And then we can work from there. We can show, I can yeah. start to help build you. Some teachers might want you to step back and just watch. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a bad thing either because we're all different. We all have our own different ways. So definitely just ask and then start making a plan from that and you're going to be good. Yeah. Best of luck. Yeah, you're going to be awesome. <laughs> Welcome to the best job ever. Woo! <laughs> Question number three. Uh, do you teach in Title I schools? What has been your biggest behavior challenge and how did you overcome it? I teach at a Title I. I've only taught at Title I schools. Um, I think there's a weird stigma attached to Title I. We just have to know that kids are kids. Like, we don't need to have the conversation of, of putting something in a box. Um, kids are kids, and that's what we do. That's our profession. So regardless of what type of school you work at, I think it's the story of kids are kids. Um, and so 
I don't know. I don't have yeah, anything else to say. I don't, I'm, I'm so glad that you said it the way that you said it because it is. I feel like there is this, you know, idea of I don't want to work at a Title I school because if I work at a Title I school, then I'm going to have behavior problems. <laughs> you, it, it, kids are kids. You're going to, like, it doesn't matter. Wherever you go, a kid is going to be a kid. And uh, that is dependent on whether you're at a Title I school or you're not at a Title I mm -hmm. school. So, you know, I feel like people have this idea that it's it's scary and I work at a title one school it's not scary it's the bomb like I love my school <laughs> and I love, I love my school kids. too love my school yes I love my my whole entire district that yes. I work for is title one Amen. um and I love it uh, I yeah. love it I love it too I would I would not change it at all or it's on my phone um <laughs> I this is pretty funny okay uh, I love your Instagram, but I don't understand how you keep your classroom so organized and clean. <laughs> Jay, do you yes. shove things in cabinets? Oh, yeah. Do you put things under the table? Oh, yes. It's, it's, uh, I don't believe it like in life, but in the classroom, it's like, um, uh, what's, the, for it, what's the saying? It's like... Uh, organized chaos. No, it's not organized chaos. Uh. It's like, um if it's like if it's if i don't see it then it's not there right like yeah that's, yeah yeah, that's yeah. cabinets are great um but really to be honest like why my classroom is so organized is because that's who i am like i i i mean i don't even know if it is that organized you just maybe the picture makes you feel that way but um as far as like just keeping things neat and tidy like I, it's my expectation for the students like i i tell them like we can't learn and we can't do the great things that we want to do if our our environment's not dirty and it takes it takes training and it takes showing them like hey this is how i expect this is how you, i want you to put things away in the library this is how i want you to put things away in your book box it doesn't always work out and sometimes a hot mess um but it's I, and if you want that i think you have to remember like these are kids and you got to show them and you got to remind them and you got to remind them again um but because it's important to me and it's important to our livelihood in the classroom uh i do it and i yeah. think um so for the most part, yes, things are clean, things are put away, but it takes training. And uh, once the kids kind of understand it, then they start to, to, to do it. Like, I don't have to tell them sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And then it's just part of our classroom. And, and when it doesn't happen, I remind them and we're back on track. I think for me, it's all about finding systems that work for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I've seen that on your Instagram, you have file cabinets and you, like you show how you use your file cabinets, how you organize that. And mm -hmm. that's a system that works really, really well for you. Um, so I feel like it's important to find that system that works the best yeah. for you, you know, kind of go out there and see what other teachers are doing, ask questions, go and kind of peek into what other, you know, what other teachers systems teachers are using inside of your school, and then take little bits and pieces there. Um, the biggest part is one having the commitment to do it like you have to say, I'm not going to walk away from this, I'm going to spend, you know, everybody's going to do a five or 10 minute cleanup, and we're all going to focus on, uh oh. Are we good? Are you alive, Junior? Jay. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go. <laughs> Sorry, my my internet got a little unstable there. Okay. Um, I, I looked. I looked at mine. I was like, my internet's unstable. Like it told me that my internet was unstable. okay. Yeah, Sorry. It, yeah, it told me the same thing though. Um, so I feel like. Are you gonna look at the screen, Jay? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like <laughs> um, it's important to find a system that kind of works for you and making sure that you're setting aside a time for you to be able to put things away and kind of get it all put off, put up. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know that in the morning, I'm going to give myself five or 10 minutes to be able to get my things out, get it ready for the day. So I'm not having a mess. I know that for sure that I'm going to like at the after, end of the day, I have about a five or 10 minute, like I will look at the clock. I will even tell Alexa to set my timer for 10 minutes. And I will just focus, focus on just cleaning for the next 10 minutes so that I can 
stay nice and neat and organized. But I think the absolute most important thing is your systems that are in place. Like mm. I use binders to be able to put away all of my unit stuff. I use a file folder to be able to organize like what I have for like copies for that week and, or for the month, however it may be. Um, so having systems is huge and just kind of figuring out what, what works best for you. Cause I know it took me I don't know. It took me like two or three years to figure out that, oh, binders is what is best for the way my mind works. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that it's like figuring out what works best for you and then also what's working for your students. So you got to keep them in mind too, like the environment that you're creating for them. Um, is, it, is, it, is it getting in the way of the learning that needs to take place? And if so, then you need to check your systems and figure out something that works. Um, but for me, like, like I said, like I, I don't feel like our classroom can go where I can instruct well if things are not um, in place like they are now. But also, like I'm not very organized when it comes to like my own note taking or my own planning. Like I'm sticky notes everywhere. I'm I write I'm a teacher planner. planner. <clears throat> <clears throat> I, I tried. <laughs> I tried, you know. And the planner feels nice and it looks pretty, but I never use it. I just yeah. it's and but that's okay. There's that's no, not you. Right. And you gotta you be, be okay. A journal with, guy. I wish I was that too, but I'm not. I'm, but like you know, I I knew someone who, like this something like just like a notes. Like yes, you I've tried. I've all tried. your notes. No, I've it doesn't work. Too. No, I've I find I find happiness in like writing post its and mm -hmm. then like scratching off whatever I got done and then your being able to it. crumple it up and done out of my life. Do you have a wall in your house that's like filled with post its? No, they're just posters are like crammed in my pocket. <laughs> I sometimes I, I pack them to like the back of my yes. phone. Do you have uh, it on your laptop? Like it's on your laptop, yes. like you stick them yes. on there. <laughs> yep. So don't feel like, um, so don't get, don't, my friend who asked me that question, yes, I keep some things organized, but I'm not organized all the way. So don't, don't stress yeah, it. Find something that works. Funny stuff. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're not so, going to show you the crazy stuff all the time. Just find a system that works for you. And if you're not happy, make a change about it or make a change. If you are happy and it's working, go for it. Go for it. So question number five is what's one thing that you would change about teaching? Oh, that's a good one. I loved this one. This is good. <laughs> What would I change about teaching? Oh my gosh, okay. I would say the standardized testing. I would get rid of standardized testing because if you look at the stress, the stressors and the things that, the only, the things that come up and it feels like everyone wants to talk about is the standardized testing. And sometimes I feel like it does nothing but create more problems. And I feel like learning is natural. And I think even if you look at our modern times now with Google and YouTube, um, humans are curious people. They want to know things. And when we start to um, cram that up with, putting them in boxes, then people stop caring about stuff. Um, so what's the, and then the question is, is like, well, how can we, what teacher accountability, like how do we know what you're doing? Um, I always say just like, I don't know, all that money you spend on tests, like put someone in my classroom and make them, just have them watch me and make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed mm -hmm. to, like and that I'm doing best for my students. Um, Cause I think that's what's most important. So if I could just, get rid of standardized testing and find a better valuable way to keep teachers accountable. I think our education system can start to just flourish. But I think right now that's the one thing that just gets in people's way or gets people out of the classroom. And it's a bummer. Yeah. You know, Jay, I feel so privileged to be working in the district that I'm working in because they are, um, they see the fact that standardized testing isn't worth it. Um, and they are very strong advocates for not taking the test. Like they, they vocally will tell you that it's not a good thing. Mm. Um, so I'm very privileged to work in this district because they don't put teachers with that number. You know what I mean? So they don't kind of judge our, our teaching on that number. They don't look at us that way. With that being said, um, they are very, very focused on making sure that we are fitting 
each individualized student's needs. And um, I'm right now reading a community book that my district is, is reading and it's called Freedom to Learn. And in this book, they're talking about the disservice that the public school systems are doing to our kids these days and talks about how they um, they don't change like we haven't changed for years and years and years like they've been doing the same things, you know, for the last since like the 1900s. Um, and how has this really helped with the way that our time day and age has changed now um, with technology with all of the advances that we've had in society, but yet our education system is still the way that it is. They view it more as in we are creating lifelong learners by showing them how to how to learn using the devices using the technology that this world has now you know given us which is like cool you know what i mean it's really really neat so i feel like that would be the first thing that i would have said with you is standardized testing but i don't have that <laughs> so it's like i mean i don't really worry about it oh, okay. i know i do well, do it gonna, i have I'm to do it to you know what i mean like I, te I, I have to do the standardized test, but it's not something that is of importance to my district. So it's not important to me. It's not important to my kids because it's one test. It's one day. Does it really show how our kids do on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Does it really show a, a reader, that kid who stays up in the middle of the night with their flashlight reading a book? Does mm -hmm. it show that? Um, which we don't think so, you know what I mean? It's one day. And then half the time, all the kids are freaking stressed out. Their anxiety is like going through the roof. So, you know, it's hard. And then yeah. you have kids who are all on so many different levels um, yeah. in their learning and their stages of learning that it, is a nine-year-old truly, do they all have to be the exact same? Right. Think, you know, they're, no. I don't know. I'm, I'm just glad that I don't have to do it. <laughs> I'm really, I'm like thankful over here. <laughs> um, I feel like the only other thing that I, I don't know what I would change, to be honest, as much as like, I feel like I have it all in, in such a good place right now. Um, I, my district goes away from grades for, and starts looking more towards mastery. And, you know, now we have the multi-age classroom, which I feel like that is where I would love to see education go is more towards multi-age because you're really truly being able to meet individualized needs versus putting all of the nine-year-olds into one classroom and saying all of the nine-year-olds are going to learn all of this because this is what we think is appropriate for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I have some nine-year-olds who are learning sixth grade curriculum. Are we to say that that's not appropriate for them? I would think that that's pretty freaking amazing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't know what I would change. I would change standardized testing for all of you people out there. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. A good one. All right, let's go. All right, question number six. How do you get your students to read? Oh, this is a good question. Sorry. No. Do you want to come say hi to Junior? Yeah. You don't want to? No. Blaine. You know what? I think for me, it's to show them the joy that you get out of reading. Mm -hmm. Showing them what reading looks like and how, what a, a true reader does. Um, I remember in the very beginning of school, and even now, I will plop right next to a student at a desk or that are sitting down on the you know the floor with a bunch of cushions I'll pull up my cushions I'll pull up my book and I'll sit there and read and they all just kind of look at you like what is she doing <laughs> why is that teacher reading a book and I remember there were moments when I truly did get it like I would always like truly read the book like I'm not just sitting there with the book yeah. open like just kind of faking it do you know what I mean like I'm really reading this book and I remember that I was reading the book 9-11. Have you seen that one? Mm -hmm. the, no, the, it's 9-10. I'm sorry. It's 9.10, right? Like the day like before 9-11? It was the day before 9-11. So I was reading that book. And I remember, I am such an emotional person. <laughs> because in that book, I started crying, Junior. Like, no joke. Like, I'm sitting there with my kids and I'm spending like the first like 10 minutes. I'm just showing them what readers do. And I try to do it, you know, a couple of days a week where I just spend the first 10 minutes of me yeah. reading. You know what I mean? 
and I start like bawling. And so like one of my kids comes up and he gives me a tissue <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> but yeah. you know what I mean? Like they see you and they automatically start asking you questions. They're like, what are you reading? Oh, is it good? Why did you pick that book out? And it already starts at kind of that curiosity about books and that mm -hmm. curiosity of like, you know, why is she choosing these types of books? And mm -hmm. you know, what is the, why is she reading this? But yeah. I don't, you know what I mean? Like it just shows them this like love of, of reading and that you can read at any age and love it. Yes. I felt like that completely changed my classroom when I just sat down and read books. Mm -hmm. And not just a, like not aloud, so please don't think that either. Like I still read aloud to my students every single day. We have a read aloud, but this me sitting down enjoying a book that I'm personally reading, um, that is what I'm talking about. Showing them that I like to curl up with a good book and just kind of read at the same time. So mm -hmm. I think for me that was a game changer. Yeah. What do you think? Um, so I love reading. I love teaching reading. I love uh, living a life amongst books. Um, I think, and I've always been that way. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't associate, my, I, I read, but I didn't associate myself as a reader until like I was actually in the classroom. Uh, I just never made that connection. No one ever helped me make that connection. So that's why I try to do it so much for my students because once, once you feel that, once you can call yourself a reader, and proudly, mm -hmm. um, the world's yours. Like you can, whatever you want. And yeah. so I get this question a lot. Like, how do you get your kids to read? Well, one, I wish I could tell you that I walk into a classroom and I say, hello, children, I have a book. And then everyone's like, whoa. <laughs> Everything's Dude, That doesn't happen for you? No, I'm so what? sorry to say. No. Take the illusion away. That does not happen. But we get there. That's, that's what I want to say. We get there and sometimes it's super, super hard and it's super challenging. But one of the, if you are somebody who's struggling with that and you have students who don't read, one thing you, I want you to ask yourself is like, are you walking the walk? Or are you just plopping a book in front of a kid and saying like, read? Because in working with teachers and teachers that I meet or that, I, that I've seen, sometimes I feel like you expect your students to read by, by just saying like, do it. Right, you're not showing them um, wh why they should be reading, or how they should be reading, or what they should be reading. And so I always say, like with my struggling readers, um, when I get the reluctant reader, then me in my classroom, I'm on overdrive, right? Like I, I want my students to to under like connect my identity to books. So I'm always talking about books. I'm always ta sharing books. Um, my classroom is full with them. And so when my, those students who are reluctant and not, and not um, wanting to read, then that's when you really have to sit down and you have to say, okay, who is this kid? What do they like? Get to know them. And then this is where it comes in that you have to have a bank of books. This is why you want to be surrounded by books. And so you can start thinking, okay, this student likes action. So I need to introduce them to graphic novels or this student is a social butterfly. I need to find some good realistic uh, fiction stories that deal with characters and um, building relationships and character development and things like that. So that's kind of like what my inner workings in my head, right? Mm -hmm. So be about it. Like if you are a reading teacher, you need to be reading. So that way you know what that's like for the student. And, and don't so, you find that they want to constantly talk to you about those books? Yes. You know and what I, I mean? Do. Especially when you recommend it to them. Because right. I had some boys who I recommended the Spiderwet Chronicles. I love the Spiderwet Chronicles. Like, they were so good. I remember reading them when I was going through in school, like, to be a teacher. I read them at that point. That's, I started, like, buying books and reading them as I was going. And all they wanted to do was, like, have these conversations about it. You know, mm -hmm. I think that was what really drew them to it was because I could have that conversation with them about this book. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when they found a different book that they like, they recommended it to me and they wanted me to read it so that again, we could have that connection and have that conversation about it. Right. And I think it's just, it's, it's, a, it's that simple, but it's also that complex, right? Like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm telling you to be about, it. you got to be a reader. You got to know your books. And then when the, the student's not reading, you need to sit down and have that reading conference and figure out what's going on. And then when there is an issue, 
help them set those goals so they can start getting back on track. And don't expect them to just after that one green conference to just be ready to go. We got to keep checking in on them, keep motivating them, keep getting books in their hands. And it's hard. It's hard work, but it's so worth it because once you finally get them there and they're wanting to read on their own, I can't explain that feeling. It's one of the best feelings. I think that's what like keeps me in the classroom because I just want to keep giving that to kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so then also check what kind of reading you're doing. If you are a reading teacher and a lot of your reading instruction is coming from passages, remember that's a standardized form of reading. Mm -hmm. So you're just reading things that are in a box. That's not exciting. Uh, is it? A, and I understand like it, it's necessary, right? If we're setting, if these kids have to take standardized tests, they have to see it. But if that's the major part of your instruction, uh, who would want to, like, how, why would not be motivated to read that? I've never read a standardized reading story, a standardized test with a story that said, wow, who wrote this? Like, I want to buy this. I've never felt that way. Right. Um, and I remember, I don't know where I heard it, but someone once said, like, I've never met a four-year-old that didn't want to read. Right. And so like when the kids first start reading, they're excited and they're taking mm -hmm. in books. So then what happens when they're leaving first in kindergarten? kindergarten What's that disconnect? Where's that disconnect happening? What mm -hmm. are we doing to them where they no longer want to pick up books, where they're no longer excited? Joe and Jay, I want to kind of chime in on this because I feel like we've had conversations with teachers within my district in my school about this. But when you are constantly tagging an assignment to their daily reading, mm -hmm. um, I feel like in my opinion, that is something that is like saying that, oh, I have to read. So then I have to do a writing assignment afterwards, or I have to answer questions directly afterwards. Well, why? What is the purpose of it? You know, is it true? Do you truly have to have something because you're trying to hold them accountable um, instead of trying to just create a reader? I feel mm -hmm. like all the times, well, teachers are like, well, well, I need I need them to do something every day with their reading because I need to hold them accountable for their reading time. Mm -hmm. How do I actually know if they're reading? Junior, going back to your conferences, that's when you know if they're reading. <laughs> when you're sitting down with them and you're having those conferences, that's where those conferences are so, so important to have with them every right. single day. But tagging things along, like just saying, well, I'm going to have them write a summary every single day. I feel like that's hurting our readers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Are we looking for their writing abilities or are we looking for their reading and truly seeing if they're comprehending and they're having this like love and this true enjoyment and joy of, of reading a text. So mm -hmm. kind of thinking of it as what am I having my kids do? Am I constantly trying to give my kids assignments to go along with their reading or am I truly just letting them read and then having conversations about books? Mm -hmm. Because that's what we do as adults. Like as an adult, I'm not going to go through, read a book and then say, well, now I'm going to go take this 10 question quiz and write a complete summary about how this chapter made me feel and complete a reflection on it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I don't do that as a reader. Mm. I jot down notes. I put down things on sticky notes, but then I want to have conversations with people about them. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what we should be showing our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's, and that's one thing too. It's like, it sounds simple, but it's not, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more you do it, the better you get at it. And so if you're sitting there and you feel like you're a teacher who needs to do more reading in the classroom or needs to get more uh, actual books in your instruction, just be ready. Like, it's hard. Like I didn't, it was hard for me. It's still hard because I'm always trying to get better. Um, so it's not easy work, but it's necessary and it's worth it. Um, so I don't know. I think that's just something that you're always going to have to keep working on. Just get more, build those relationships with the students, get to know them as readers, have books, provide those experiences for them and don't feel defeated when it doesn't happen, when it doesn't happen right away. Just keep at it, keep conferencing with them show them that you want to build them as readers and they're, go they're going to grow for you. They're going, they're going to come some mm -hmm. faster than others, but you just got to do it. Yeah. And not looking at like, don't try to compare them to someone who's been reading mm -hmm. you know, who goes home and just reads all day long. Um, but also reward and congratulate all of the small accomplishments. The fact mm -hmm. that they did read those five pages, <laughs> you know what I mean? In yeah. class, like it may have taken them all of the 30, 40 minutes, but you're like, yay, you read five right. pages. Like congratulate them and make them feel good and show them that, you know, 
you are making steps to becoming a reader and that's what we want to see. No, we don't want you to look like little Billy over there who's reading 50 pages a day, you know, whatever you're doing to kind of build your reading. That's, mm -hmm. it's great. It's a wonderful thing. And we should also like support and congratulate our kids when they do some of those accomplishments. And then one last thing, because we could probably talk about this all night. Uh, just also do the work of uh, reading professional text. Mm -hmm. uh, I always give credit to Donald and Miller's The Reading Whisperer and Reading in the Wild. Reading those two books really shifted my way of thinking in the classroom and my reading instruction. So if you want a place to start, I say start there. Um, it's a great jumping zone and then it'll just send you to where you need to be to give the best reading instruction possible for your students. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I highly recommend um, Debbie Miller for elementary level. Like, um, so when I was in kindergarten, Debbie Miller was like amazing, phenomenal, phenomenal um, texts. Her, all of her books that she has out were great for reading, for helping me in kindergarten. Um, and I like Stephanie Harvey as well. I think she's amazing. <laughs> all right, let's go to our next question. Question Ooh. numero. Seven, lucky number seven. Yeah. <laughs> lucky number seven. All right. So, uh, Jay, how oh. do you or would you deal with an unsupportive principal? Um, so here's kind of my take on this. And I've only had, I've had two principals and both of my principals have been extremely supportive. Um, like I can go up to both of them. I would go up to you know, for, with anything that I had. Mm -hmm. And I could say, hey, I want to try this out. Here's the research that backs it up. Can I please do this in the classroom? They've always, always, always given me full-blown support and said, go for it and do it. So I've never been in the situation of having to deal with an unsupportive principal. Okay, let me, so I'm just going to throw that out there. So I have no idea if these ideas are going to work. But I feel like teachers always ask me and say, um, I like what you're doing with your reading block and how you're doing this, but, you know, I have to teach from some type of book, mm -hmm. right? Um, so they're always like, and my principal says, absolutely not. You have to kind of stick with it. You have to do this. This is the way it is. I don't know where I'm going with this. I know. I mean, I think that's hard if we've never been in that situation. It is hard. It is definitely hard. And no. I feel like going to your principal and maybe just asking, I mean, what does it hurt? Has anybody asked? Like that's, I guess these are the questions that I would have for that person. Mm -hmm. like, you know, does, have, has anyone ever approached this principal and said, here's kind of our ideas and here are our concerns and here's kind of what we would like to be able to see. Um, Cause I just, I feel awful, but I just, I've always been so know. fortunate to have really yeah. great principles, but I feel like communication, again, that's one of the key, big key pieces of it. <clears throat> I feel like saying just like, close your door, kick, and then show them what's up. What do you say? <laughs> um... Yeah. Sorry, I mean, it is what it is. Like I, yeah, I, that's I'm what sorry. I, used I cannot, to do. I can't get, I can't give you advice because I've been fortunate in that I have always had a, uh, I've had my same principal my entire career, and they've always been super supportive. So I'm lucky in that, and I know that's not the same story for all of us. But if I was in that situation and that was my job, um, and I couldn't go find a job somewhere else, I would show them what's up and do good work and then make them pay attention to you mm -hmm. and I guess yeah and people. and I think the old thinking that I always had was that I want to do what's right for my kids you mm -hmm. know what I mean not what's right for my district but what's right for my students in that classroom because those are the ones whose lives I'm truly impacting it doesn't matter about my district mm -hmm. you know how does this really affect my district like I'm going to mm -hmm. help them in any way that I can so shut it <laughs> Junior, ready? One, two, three. Question number eight. Uh, the question is, how do you stay positive when things get hard? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, and I feel like I have been there. 
Um, last year was a very, very hard year for me, hard year for me personally, because everything that I probably, you know, you do in life, like a big change, a new job, mm -hmm. um, like those are some of the bigger stressors, stressors in life, they say. And I moved from Alabama to Pennsylvania, which was a huge difference. Um, had a new job, a new grade level. Uh, a lot of things had changed for me. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't know. I had a hard year. It was, it was rough in just kind of different areas of my life. Um, and for me, I think the biggest thing was that I was taking care of myself, um, making sure that I was giving time to myself and I was not trying to be this absolutely perfect teacher that I always kind of wanted to strive to be like certain things just kind of fell through the cracks and I had to learn to be okay with it because I knew that at that moment in time what was the most important was the fact that I needed to make sure that I was mentally physically emotionally all of that was kind of there um so I did I did spend a lot of time in making sure that I was giving myself time and I started getting to the point where I just kind of said, this is, this is the life that I have, right? It's the only life that I'm given. It's, you know, the one chance that I'm going to have this day. I'm never going to get this day back. And I need to love it for what it is. I need to love the good, the bad, the sad, the hard, the stressful. Um, I need to go in with a positive attitude. Um, Jay, you remember when I worked at Red Lobster mm -hmm. and I remember that manager that I went and started working for and he looked at me and he said, your money is solely, is all reliant on a smile. He goes, so any problems that you have, whether it be home, anything, you leave it outside of that door. Because when you walk in, if you bring those problems with you, you will not make money. I was a server. So, I mean, all of my money came from tips. You know what I mean? And so it kind of stuck with me. And it, I've always had that feeling there. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to like take that with me everywhere I go in life. Because I know that when I walk in that door, I know that I need to leave all of my problems behind me. And I need to put a smile on my face because... I need to do that for my kids. It's important for my kids that they see their teacher with a smile on. And there are days where they don't see me with a smile. It could be that I'm sick. Um, yeah, there was like a week where I was incredibly sick and they were just like, there's something wrong with Mrs. Speckman. Everybody stay away. But you know what I mean? Like I did the best and I put a smile on my face and I don't know. I just got myself through it. I feel mm -hmm. like, time time heals all wounds and i feel like i've gone on a huge rant <laughs> um, it all out. I, I don't know i don't know like i feel that that's something uh, teachers just go through we go through hard times do you know what i mean whether it be work personal you know mm. whatever it is um i think for me on the flip side um, I've always just been a positive person. I think he has. It's <laughs> true. It's a bit. It's so true. <laughs> uh, as a kid, I was happy. <laughs> as a teenager, I always was happy. Um, and I think now that I'm older and I understand myself better, and I've and I've gone through stuff. Trust me, I've gone through yeah. stuff. Um, I I just don't have time for the negative. I don't have time to feel bad. I don't make any room for it. And so when things do get hard. I acknowledge it. Uh, if I do have to kind of be in it to, because it's not to say that I don't feel sadness or I don't feel stress, because I do, but I do acknowledge it. But my brain is automatically like, okay, how do we fix it? How do I get myself feeling better? How can I make, how can I, how can I make it better? And then I always just choose the positive. I think in life you you can you have the option. You have the option to just focus on the negative or focus on the good. My focus is on the good. And when I do that, it makes it a whole lot easier to get to the good when I'm in the, in the bad, when I'm in a bad place. Um, 
and I know that's not easy for a lot of people to do we're different people our mindsets are all different mm -hmm. um, but for me like that's how I live my life like I only focus on the good that's what I put my my attention into that's what I let grow and um, because I do that when things do get hard it's a lot easier to pull out because I have the good there um, I don't know it's kind of it sounds vague but hopefully no, yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. It does. It does make sense. Sorry, I'm like, and I think, like you said, it's different for every person. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I deal with hardship very differently than the way that you deal with it. And mm -hmm. that's weird because we're both cancers. We were born eight days apart. Yeah. And like, cancers are very emotional people. So yeah. why am I a hot mess and you're not? <laughs> uh, and I wish, I wish I, I'm not, I'm not putting up a front. Like I don't, <laughs> This is no, really. This is truly what what he is. I'm. I can totally vouch for it. Like he's just a genuinely happy person. Mm -hmm. Why I'm am sorry, I the hot don't, mess? I don't know. I don't have an answer. And How I think did it's I okay. come out this it's way? Okay. It's okay. But I'm serious, y'all. Like I, I'm, I am a hot mess. Like it's okay. I'm we, that person that goes and boohoo's. The world needs a hot mess. Like right, we all need. <laughs> We don't need we don't need people a bunch of me's. We don't need a bunch of you's. We all just need to do that. And I think it's just about having tools. Like when things get hard, mm -hmm. what is your thing that's going to get you out of it, right? Like of course some things are really hard, and you need to kind of live in it, to learn from it, and to feel it. Um, but then start making your plan to get out of it, because the yeah. more that you focus on it, the more that you let it. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of people do. They just Mm -hmm. they're so overwhelmed by the hardship right. um and and i think the way that we're kind of viewing it is hardship as in like sadness right um and i think also we do it subconsciously yeah um we like i don't know it's a being a human is hard y'all yeah it is hard for real nobody said it was going to be easy no mm -mm. and no, let me tell you though like if you are going through like a hardship as in like you are just going through a very, very stressful time. Okay. Like for instance, next week for me, let's, let's just talk about this real fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Me person, I have DRAs due, my writing assessments are due. I have to also, my report cards are due. Our first conferences are going to be on Friday and I'm going to have an observation. All yeah. next week. Let's talk about some hardships right there. Now I feel like a lot of people automatically, and again, this goes back to Jay looking at the positive, but they all want to just start griping about it. Well, why do I have to do this? Well, didn't they understand that we had all these things that we have to turn in? So why did they schedule your observation during that? I can't believe that they did that to you. Okay, mm -hmm. listen, we can all sit here, we can gripe and complain about it, or we can start creating a plan and start figuring out what is it that I need to do so that I can move on and start getting my things done. Because me complaining is not getting my things done. It's not right. helping me at all. So create a list, like write right. your things down. Figure out, okay, well, if I have DRAs due, let's see, um, I have those finished. Maybe I can do grade all my 40s tonight, all of my 50s tomorrow, all of my 60s the next day, have those done by this day. My writing assessments, I got to do those tomorrow. So that means I can grade those on the weekend and get those uploaded. Boom, two things are tackled. Do you know what I mean? So I yeah. feel like teachers have a tendency to... Uh, want to just kind of gripe about it and let it out and I and I do that too like please don't think that I'm not a venter like I vent like I will really quick I'll just either text him or I'll tell my partner and say I just need to let this out I don't understand and I'll get it all out and I'll say all right let's go game plan and we'll get it done and we'll get through that hardship and that really stressful time so I feel like we kind of have now looked at it from two different perspectives yeah I might and I think like when it's that way, when it's, it's the, the, oh my gosh, because our job is so much and sometimes mm -hmm. our plate gets so full, it, and that once you're in it, like once you've been teaching for a while, I feel like the same thing happens every year. Like you get to a point where you're like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do. Oh yeah. And sometimes then just think back, you've done it before, you've survived it before. Mm -hmm. So get to it. Like, let's go. Yeah. And I started telling myself that too, Junior, like where I was just like, you know what? Like, People always ask, well, how do you manage to get it all done? I don't know how I get it all done, but somehow magically it does get all done. So mm -hmm. I stopped stressing about it and I started thinking it's going to get done. It all yeah. gets done. Eventually it'll get done. I don't know how it all get it yeah. done yet, but I'm going to get it done. Yeah. So what is the purpose of me stressing out about it? Right. right. 
Yeah. And I still, and even I do that. Like sometimes I just think about doing something and then I spent all this time thinking that I didn't actually do anything. Yeah. So sometimes that happens too. Yeah. Um, again. So, hardships yeah. are going to happen. I think you yes. kind of, again, come up with some tools like Junior said mm -hmm. and start figuring out ways that you can start tackling things. Yes. And be positive. There's yes. our lesson for today. And be remember also positive. Be positive. But remember, we work with kids. And no matter like how bad the day is or how crazy admin is or the crazy stuff that we have to do as teachers that means nothing to the growth of children, kids should make you happy. Like that's what keeps me coming back every day. Like the smiles, the crazy stories, the weird things that they do. Um, those, that's why we're there and like focus on that. So if you're in the classroom and you're, you're struggling, focus on the kids, even mm -hmm. the ones that you're having troubles with, like start building that relationship and you're going to start to grow an appreciation for them um so yeah. it's a great it's way to, great way to end it jay yes it's hard this job is hard don't let don't let pretty pictures fool you but it's also so much fun and so if you're in the profession remember that and if you're not in the profession and you're on your way it's gonna be good on to my last question which is question number nine um how long is your ela block and how do you break the times down so small group, whole group, uh, writing. Okay. So I do, I teach. So, okay, here's the thing. We're all going to have different, like, I wish it looked the same for everybody and it's not, right? So it's not, it doesn't matter what my block looks like or what the time allowance I have. What's important for you is to say, okay, what is the time that I have? And then what is what's most important? The read aloud, the giving them time to read, the giving them time to write start there look at what you have to work with and then put in what's most important and fix your block that way mm -hmm. so i think spending time and sitting here and sharing what i do or what i have is not is not going to be beneficial so i'll share what's most important to me i need read aloud time i need time for my students to read i need and this is something that i've learned just recently or just in the past couple of years i need a share time share mm -hmm. time is super important i need time for my students to write. Are you talking about share time as in reading and writing for mm -hmm. both of them, those yeah, subjects? So the closure. Uh, in the the past closing year, for your, for those blocks. Okay. In, in the past couple, when I first started teaching, like that was something that I always feel like I could kind of X out. And when I got more purposeful with it, uh, and it's quick, like I'm, I'm quick with it, but mm -hmm. I see it's, it's nice to, to have a, a closure to the things that we're doing. Uh, and so that's something that I've just recently learned. So I think, yeah, I don't think, I know it's good to see other people's block because then you can kind of start manipulating your own, but start with just looking at what you have and then what's most important and get those things in and then everything else, you'll find a way to kind of weave in and out. That's, that's what I've learned about uh, the ELA. It's kind of like, it's a, it is a big old bowl of spaghetti. Like it's just it noodles is. and things. So just stick to what's M&M, &M, syrup, you know. Yeah, everything. Everything's in it. Uh, so just give your, do what's most important. Give them time to read. Give them time to write. That is, that's going to give you the best bang for your buck. Yeah. Well, how many groups do you fit in in a day? Uh, on a good, well, okay. So some days, like, my mini lessons are quick. So my independent time is a little bit longer. And on those days, uh, on a good day, it's three. But on a regular day, it's two. And then in between that, then there's also like individual conferences, but they're yeah. not happening during independent time. It's also happening like in the mornings. Yeah. As we're packing up. Whenever you can get them in, right? Yeah. The individual Whenever ones. Whenever you can yes. get them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for weird. me, it's going to be really, really different just because of the class that I teach. Um, mm -hmm. With multi-age, like we just needed to be able to fit with each individualized needs. Um, so what we ended up doing is coming up with individualized schedules. So we don't have like an ELA block. I don't have a math block or science, mm -hmm. like a content block. I have uh, rotation schedules. Pretty much, I would kind of say like a, a middle school, right? Like the bells would mm -hmm. ring and you'd go to your next class, that type of idea. So yeah. it's a, a rotation schedule that you would have. Um, and I don't teach whole group, I only teach small groups. So all of my mini lessons, everything kind of happens within a small group setting. So I have four, four reading 
uh, groups and I will meet with them. I will give them something very specific for them to kind of go back and either think about within their own text or I give them something that they are truly kind of practicing. Um, it just depends like on what it is that I'm doing and on what part of the scaffolding, you know, process that we're kind of going through. So, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of pretty much how mine is again it's very very different from yours and there's i don't think there is a right or wrong but all of the things that junior has like all of those things i incorporate as well like they have independent writing they have independent reading you know they have like a time where they can be able to you know discuss group like with their group or with partners or something they can discuss the skill the strategy that we're focusing on with one another so that they're giving they're given that talking time um right. instead of us being always the one that are talking and i feel like those are kind of the most important pieces i think you said it beautifully junior like focusing on the pieces versus us trying to show you what our reading time mm -hmm. uh, like looks like as far as time goes i think just understanding that here are the pieces to the puzzle <laughs> to make this ela block it's just now figuring out how are you going to put those pieces into your time your time blocks i say if you gave if you let your kids read you gave them time to read you gave them time to write you're doing right by kids and that's it like that's what they need they need, time, right. to read, they need time to write. Drop we, the mic. We, all right. And our last question, question number 10, has nothing to do with Bridget. So I'm just going to take over and answer this question. I'm so sorry, B. The question is, how did you become a scholastic blogger? Oh, do I know the answer to this? You know. I think I do the end. I think I do. So I, uh, this year, had the privilege of um, blogging for Scholastic. And so I blog twice a month now. Check it out. Uh, top teaching, Scholastic Top Teaching blog. A little promo in there. Yes, and it's not <laughs> just me. Um, there's tons of teachers from all over the country, uh, different grade levels, dishing out lesson ideas. Uh, it's super fun blog to check out. And I feel, yeah, I'm so lucky to be part of it. And the way that I got part, or that I, I, I blog for Scholastic now is through Instagram. Um, I post my teaching life on Instagram and uh, they saw my classroom. And so then uh, Scholastic Teacher Magazine featured my classroom in the, uh, in the magazine. And then uh, after that, the editor of the blog saw my spread and they contacted me and they felt like I had things that I could share and they brought me onto their blog team. And now I blog for Scholastic. Um, so I feel like I have another question for you. Bring it um, on. That everyone always wants to know, Jay, why don't you do a YouTube channel? Oh my gosh, y'all. <laughs> and it's so funny because like I will check comments and I'll see that or Bridget will text me. Um, here's the truth. YouTubers, <laughs> all, the, all the praise to you guys because I know editing and putting videos together is hard work. And uh, I, own, me, I'm only, I only do things that I'm passionate about. If I'm not excited about it, then I don't. Um, I don't do it. And I feel like uh, video editing would really bog me down and uh, making sure my hair looks right. Like I, I've, that's the things that I don't want to think about. So I just don't <laughs> do it. So it's so kind of fun. You heard it from Mr. G himself. It's because <laughs> of the hair. <laughs> it's, because, it's because of the hair. How sad is that? Uh, no, it's a, I love YouTube. I love watching YouTube. Um, and I love Bridget's channel. And so it's fun getting to do little things like this but will i ever make a youtube channel maybe and i'm wait i'm always saying this because um this summer i am going to australia with a bunch of teachers and we're going to go visit schools in australia and check out the country and check out uh, a school there and that's just such a, a rad thing that i'm doing as a teacher that i want to remember every piece of it so um i might just do it for that like just kind of put that together so I have that as a memory, but then also to be able to share out with other teachers or people who are interested. Um, and hopefully Bridget will guide me in that and I'll have that. But then that's it because that's it. Then I'll just go back to- It'll be great. You'll be fine. You'll do great. Be yes, great. because I have you, so yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, there you go. You guys got the answer now. So no more asking that question. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm teasing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. It's all that's of the, the questions that we have yes. for tonight. I so appreciate all of you guys for watching. Please make sure to give the video a thumbs up if you really enjoyed hearing from both of us, kind of give you a little bit of a teacher talk. Um, so yeah. be sure to hit that thumbs up button if you are not subscribed to my channel and you like what you see, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you can get more videos from uh, maybe both of us sometime in the future again, who knows? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you so much everyone for watching and we will see you all really, really soon. Bye. Bye. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. It's also hard because like, I hope, I don't know, I'm always just worried that teachers, I know how hard this job is and I don't want teachers to, to feel alone.